Hello everyone. Today I will be talking about a new um, research uh, which has come in the British Journal of Anesthesia called as the Driving Pressure Trial. Uh, it is basically uh, driving pressure guided ventilation and uh, post-operative complica pulmonary complications, uh, specifically in thoracic surgery patients. It was a multi-center randomized control trial by Park et al. So uh, the pulmonary complications are basically the most common complications in thoracic surgery. And they are also the leading cause of mortality in patients undergoing thoracic surgery. So lung protection uh, for preventing such complications is important. And uh, when uh, you are thinking of uh, lung protection and protective ventilation strategies, we usually it is comprised of three things. That is using small tidal volumes. Uh, limiting the inspiratory pressures and the application of a positive end expiratory pressure, that is the PEEP. So with these three things, you, you, we usually uh, try to achieve protective ventilation in thoracic surgery patients. However, recently several uh, retrospective studies have suggested that uh, all these three things, uh, the tidal volume, the inspiratory pressure limitation, and an application of PEEP, are not really related to the patient outcomes and uh, they are only related to outcomes when they influence the driving pressure. So the driving pressure, as you know, is uh, basically the blood to pressure minus the PEEP, uh, which is uh, the amount of pressure that drives during inspiration. So what is the evidence till now? Uh, there was only one prospective study about driving pressure guided ventilation in thoracic surgery patients. In this study, there was the PEEP which was titrated to bring the lowest driving pressure in each patient. And uh, although there was uh, individualized PEEP which was applied uh, to reduce the driving pressure, uh, it reduced the instance of pulmonary complications. And the study size was uh, small and it was only a single center study with 312 patients. So with this study in background, the authors tried to ask a clinical question of whether a strategy utilizing a systemic alveolar recruitment and individualized PEEP titration to minimize airway driving pressure, which was the driving pressure guided ventilation, would reduce the occurrence of pulmonary complications within the first seven postoperative days compared to a conventional protective ventilation regimen with a fixed PEEP of 5 centimeters of water in lung resection surgery patients. So do remember that this trial was basically in lung resection surgery in thoracic surgery patients and not in general population of patients who are undergoing surgery. So the PICO statement was uh, the population being adult patients uh, between 19 to 100 years of age scheduled for elective thoracic surgery. The, in, <clears throat> the control group was basically the driving pressure group. The intervention group was the conventional protective ventilation group. And the outcome group was the composite of predefined major postoperative pulmonary complications within the first seven days after the surgery. So, this was a good endpoint that they took as an outcome, as a primary outcome, was that they took it as pulmonary complications rather than mortality. And also, they tried to see it in the first seven days after surgery when, when there is the highest incidence of pulmonary complications after thoracic surgery. So, the inclusion criteria was patients who were 19 years or older and they had an ASA physical status of 1 to 3. And all of them had to undergo a lung dissection surgery. Uh, which included either a segmentectomy, lobectomy, bilobectomy, sleeve lobectomies, or pneumonectomies. And also, one important point was uh, they using uh, patients, as in uh, they they including patients with one lung duration of uh, one lung ventilation duration of at least sixty minutes or more. So this was important again because uh, if you have enough adequate time for one lung ventilation, more than 60 minutes, and using a particular strategy, then you might achieve adequate amounts of exposure to that particular ventilation strategy, which might ultimately show up any show up any differences, if at all it is present. <coughs> the exclusion criteria for basically patients who are having heart failure symptoms and who had large uh, bullae or plebs and pneumothoraces, patients who were also excluded if they were pregnant or lactating, Patients uh, were also excluded if patients were, were being anticipated to be included in similar studies uh, from other places and if, also, if they also had a joint operation such as an extra pulmonary surgery or, or refusal of consent. 
coming to the study design uh, basically it was uh, um, the study was done in multiple icus in south korea and it was a national interventional study and uh, uh, it it used double blinding uh, in its uh, uh, methodology and which was a subject investigator and, and outcome assessor were all blinded uh, in the in their original uh, article and in the supplementary appendix the boxes are given the uh, further details as to how the blinding was done there was also allocation concealment and uh, randomization was uh, done according stratified according to the pft of the patients and the study duration was uh, approximately 1 to 1 and 1/2 years from march 2020 to may 2021 so coming to the proper protocol per se uh, it the the authors have put into two groups as i have already said it was one was the driving pressure group the other was the conventional ventilation group so in the driving pressure group if you uh, notice there are three phases to uh, to each of the ventilation strategies so in the driving pressure group we initially have two lung ventilation when the patient has been anesthetized over here with the where my the sir is present uh, this patient now once the patient undergoes uh, gets anesthetized he undergoes two lung ventilation for a period of time until then uh, when the actual surgery is about to start on the affected lung when the patient has to undergo one lung ventilation and after that uh, one lung ventilation again patient undergoes a two lung ventilation strategy uh, which is going to again continue until the end of surgery when the patient has is going to be extubated at this point of time uh, when he has uh, he has finished the complete when the complete anesthesia time is going to get over so in these three phases of uh, surgery uh, initially when the patient is on going on a two lung ventilation uh, the patient undergoes a recruitment maneuver over here this is this is the place where the patient is undergone a recruitment maneuver and then the patient undergoes a peep titration after that until there is a lowest driving pressure which can be achieved for that uh, two lung ventilation strategy uh, similarly in the one when the patient undergoes a one lung ventilation uh, here he or she again undergoes a recruitment maneuver and uh, then undergoes a peep titration until a lowest driving pressure is reached and similarly again when the patient goes back on a two lung ventilation he undergoes a recruitment maneuver and then followed by a peep titration again to achieve the lowest driving pressure which he continues throughout the rest of the two lung ventilation so each of these recruitment maneuvers uh, what they have done is basically they have uh, titrated the peep Uh, in incremental values of 5 cm of water so initially the patient is on 5 cm of water of peep and gradually the peep has been increased to 10 and gradually later again it has been increased to 15 so in this way they have tried to achieve recruitment in all these three phases so when the patient is on 5 and then increased to 10 and then again up to 15 uh, there is a possibility that the uh, amount of inspiratory plateau pressure which has reached the reached 30 so that was the uh, that was the safety end point for them that even if uh, during recruitment at any point of time if the plateau pressure reached 30 then they would have to stop the recruitment at the lower level of peep and uh, then after achieving recruitment uh, the peep titration will always have to start from 10 cm of water so even though the recruitment was achieved at suppose 15 cm of water then they would have to start come down to 10 cm of water of peep and then start the peep titration so uh, this peep titration was basically a decremental peep titration where uh, peep was reduced from 10 cm of water to 9 to 8 and so on and so forth until they achieved the lowest driving pressure which will guide their ventilation strategy for the rest of their ventilation uh, ventilation duration in that particular two lung or one lung ventilation time so the same way uh, all of these three phases were conducted an initial recruitment maneuver followed by a peep titration that is a decremental peep titration which was done so in the conventional ventilation group uh, there was uh, basically uh, almost the same sort of strategy which was employed uh, except the fact that uh, the conventional ventilation group underwent uh, basically a constant peep throughout the all three phases of ventilation during surgery that is a constant peep of 5 and uh, the uh, number of recruitment maneuvers was only one in the conventional ventilation group 
that is when the patient underwent in the initial part when the patient is undergone induction of anesthesia then that is the only point of time when they had a recruitment maneuver for the conventional ventilation group and followed by a uh, followed by a constant peep of 5 cm of watch which was maintained throughout the whole of the surgery and uh, there was no separate recruitment maneuvers which were done in the one lung ventilation during one lung ventilation or during the second time uh, second time when the two lung ventilation was also uh, going on so this was one difference between the driving pressure group and the conventional ventilation group that the conventional ventilation group underwent recruitment only once and the peep was not titrated according to the driving pressure rather the peep was kept constant at 5 cm of water so what are the common things in the protocol for both the groups in both the groups the volume control ventilation was used and ventilation rate was adjusted to 10 to 18 beats per minute to maintain an atco2 between 35 to 45 mm of mercury uh, the assigned ventilating strategy was applied uh, from the time the patient was intubated for general anesthesia at the operating room and continued until the extubation after the surgery so one of the other things to note was the fact that uh, these patients actually were on anesthesia ventilators inside the op so uh, trying to achieve trying to get a value for a plateau pressure there are there is no uh, there is no facility to have an inspiratory pause to to press the inspiratory pause button uh, in the anesthesia ventilators so what the authors have done is basically put up a, a inspiratory pause time of around 30% of the total inspiratory time and then during the 30% of the time there is the plateau pressure which is visible uh in the vent anesthesia ventilator so coming to further methodologies the primary endpoint is was basically uh, post operative pulmonary complications within the post operative day 7 and these definitions of pulmonary complications were based on the society of thoracic surgeons general thoracic surgery databases so they were defined pulmonary complications and it was a composite of these pulmonary complications within the post operative day 7 which was the primary endpoint there were several secondary endpoints such as the pf ratio the po2 values per se during all phases of surgery uh, the lung compliance uh, 15 minutes after the initiation of a one lung ventilation there was also mortality in the first post operative the first 30 post operative days which are all secondary endpoints so there were also some few safety endpoints such as dynamic hyperinflation such as interruption of recruitment and intraoperative rescue ventilation to treat hypoxemia if the saturation was less than uh, 90% so these were all the safety endpoints the stats analysis basically they tried to calculate the sample size uh, the th they assumed that uh, uh 30% relative reduction in the pulmonary complications in the driving pressure group compared with the protective ventilation group and uh, what they they took this 30% relative reduction based on prior studies which uh, of major trials uh, with mechanical ventilation where uh, they have seen that there is that 30% is a, is a pragmatic amount of reduction in the amount of um pulmonary complications which can be taken and uh, and they assume that the incidence of pulmonary complications are approximately 19% in the protective ventilation group uh from these previous studies in itself so they assume that the number of participants to be 1170 with an 80% power and the significance level of 0.05 and uh, anticipating a 10% dropout rate the final sample size was determined to be 1300 and all these analysis which they have taken up for the patients was performed on a modified intention to treat principle uh the descriptive descriptive statistics were presented with standard deviations median values or with frequencies as appropriate and for other discrete variables they, they have used the chi square test or the fisher's exact test for continuous variables between group differences were assessed using the student's t test or the man man whitney u test according to the normality of the data and they did specify pre specify sub groups where they would perform the analysis as well after the data they after they got the data post the study coming to the results now uh, basically the patients who were eligible assessed for eligibility were approximately 1654 and out of them 1300 underwent randomization uh, and, and out of this 1300 approximately uh, around, around again 30 patients were excluded 15 in each group approximately if the surgery had to be cancelled or they withdrew the consent before the surgery 
and uh, out of these 639 uh, 637 in the pressure driving pressure guided ventilation and 639 in the uh, in the conventional protective ventilation ultimately 576 were assessed in the modified intention to treat principle for post operative day 30 so if you note here one of the good things was uh, there was a nice amount of follow up for all the patients none of the patients were lost to follow up at post operative day 30 and uh, and the exclusions were all uh, one of the other things to note is that the exclusions which 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 happened were uh, mostly because the patients had undergone a one lung ventilation of less than 60 minutes so there was a high amount of patients who had undergone one lung ventilation less than 60 minutes so they were excluded and the rest of them were included so in the demographic characteristics and the comorbidities of the patients if you see there is not much difference between the two groups and uh, and one more fact uh, which which was important was the most common sort of uh, most common sort of tumor pathology was an adenocarcinoma which was approximately 65% in both the groups and uh, the clinical stage of the cancer was approximately 65 to 70% of stage 1 uh, in both the groups and if you notice here there is an ariscat score which is there which is approximately 39.1 uh, in driving pressure and 39 in the protective ventilation so basically this ariscat score is one of the scores which assesses for the post operative pulmonary complications in patients undergoing thoracic surgery uh, so this ariscat score was on the was uh, more than uh, more than 30 which puts the patients into a intermediate to high risk of post operative com pulmonary complications so the takeaway from this high ariscat score is the fact that the patients that were included in this trial were actually a very high risk group of patients so this was a good uh, chunk of patients and a good patient population which the authors have tried, have recruited uh, to check for any differences between the two groups uh, in terms of the comorbidities, there was not, not much of difference between the two groups with respect to what comorbidities the patients had. And uh, even the, even the uh, pulmonary status of the patients in terms of the pulmonary function test category was also similar between the two groups. And also, we do note that the pulmonary function test category C was the highest in both the groups. That means the patients were actually very bad with respect to the lungs in the pre-op status. And, uh, Moving further, uh, the, the surgical procedure which was performed the maximum was basically the lobectomies, which are approximately 80% in both the groups. And uh, the minimally invasive surgery was uh, which was performed was basically the VAT surgery, which was approximately 80%, 80 to 90% in both the groups. And open thoracotomies were approximately 10% in both the groups. And uh, the intraoperative characteristics uh, were the anesthesia duration approximately three hours in both the groups and the operation duration approximately two hours in both the groups. And the estimated blood loss approximately 100% is in both the groups. Um, pretty obvious because most of the surgeries were basically video assisted thoracic VAT surgeries. So the amount of blood loss uh, was very low in both the groups. And the use of inotropes, inotropes in vesicostal agents intraoperatively was also pretty less, approximately 7 to 8% in, in both the groups. So uh, if you see, uh, this, is a, this is a graph showing uh, the intraoperative PEEP values which were used during, uh, during surgery in both the groups. The blue, uh, the blue um, bars are basically the protective ventilation group and uh, the, the purple bars are basically the driving pressure vent guided ventilation group. So if you see here, uh, the blue bars are basically um, constant. That is, there is only a fixed amount of PEEP which was used in, in the whole of the surgery. What is varying is basically the purple bars, which are uh, the driving pressure guided ventilation group, where uh, the PEEP has been titrated. PEEP has been titrated from several levels of 7 to 4. The titration has progressed over the whole duration of surgery. So initially, there is a two lung ventilation and followed by a one lung ventilation followed by a two lung ventilation again until extubation. So accordingly, the PEEP has varied in the driving pressure ventilation group. Uh, this is another graph showing the intraoperative driving pressures between in the two groups. Again, the, uh, the, blue, uh, the blue bars are basically protective ventilation group. The purple bars are basically the driving pressure ventilation group. 
and uh, this this lower uh, graph is basically the mean difference between the two groups uh, in terms of the driving pressures so if you notice here uh, this is again two lung ventilation this part this is the one lung ventilation and this is the two lung ventilation again so the there is not much difference between the two groups in terms of the the final driving pressure which was achieved so if you see here there is the maximum difference between the two groups is the is at the start of the one lung ventilation where there is a difference of 2 uh, centimeters of water of driving pressures yeah, so the driving pressure ventilation group having uh, lesser amount of driving pressure at the at the start of the one lung ventilation rest all of the times it is either either only a difference of 1 or maybe or also nil sometimes almost touching zero sometimes so basically there was not much of difference in the ultimate driving pressures which are achieved intraoperatively between the two groups although there was a driving pressure guided ventilation strategy used in one of the, in the in, in in the driving pressure guided group there was not much difference between the two groups with respect to the actual driving pressures which were where which they got so this was the intraoperative static lung compliance which was uh, which is there uh, which which was seen during the whole of surgery in the two groups here as well there is uh, there, this is the difference between the uh, two groups in the amount of static lung compliance so if you see here the driving pressure group has got slightly better compliance during the whole of surgery where uh, you have approximately 5 cm of water better compliance here at the start of the two lung and you have around 10 cm of water better compliance in the start of one lung and approximately 10 cm of water better compliance in the start of the two lung again <clears throat> so if you see here the the driving pressure group does have a better compliance during the whole of surgery so coming to the primary outcome of the study if you see that there was a composite of pulmonary complications and both the groups had almost equal amount of pulmonary complications in the first post operative week 40.5% in the driving pressure group and 42.8% in the protective ventilation group and also it was not statistically significant and what are the out, what are the components of the primary outcomes there were basically three three components which had contributed maximal to the post operative com pulmonary complications one was a saturation which was less than 90% which was approximately 20% in both the groups. Um, the second was uh, basically a pneumonia, which was approximately 9% in both the groups. And the third was basically air leakage requiring a uh, chest tube insertion for five days or more, which was approximately 10 to 11% in both the groups. And none of them were statistically significant as well. In the secondary outcomes, the, uh, the thing to note is basically the PO2 and the PF ratios. So these were the two things which were statistically significant. The PO2's ratio ratios were, were higher than the, in the driving pressure group and then the protective ventilation group. And similarly, the PF ratios are also higher in the driving pressure group than the protective ventilation group. The rest of the complications are, uh, in the which were assessed in the secondary outcomes and even the mortality within the first post-operative operative three days were not statistically different between the two groups, not statistically different between the two groups. So even if you see, uh, this is a further elaboration of the incidence of post-operative pulmonary complications. Basically, the pulmonary complications are almost same in both the groups, that is 40.5% and 42.28% respectively. And uh, when you do a sub, when they did a subgroup analysis as to see whether any particular subset of patients uh, showed any benefit, they did not find any. Uh, and even in patients who are at high risk, such as BMI, more than 25 subgroup of patients as well, there was not my, not any difference between the two groups with respect to post-operative pulmonary complications. Similarly, if uh, when your when your patient when the patients had uh, um, uh, an ARISCAT score more than 45 as well, there was not much difference between the two groups with respect to post-operative pulmonary complications or even if patients had some disease of pulmonary disease history even then there was no difference between the two groups with respect to post-operative pulmonary complications this was one of the other uh, graphs which the authors have put up uh, where they have seen that uh, in both the groups combined when they tried to see uh, the driving pressure compared to the odds ratio of pulmonary complications, they have seen that as the driving pressure has increased from 4 to 9 centimeters of water, there is a slight, there is an increase 
in the in the odds ratio of pulmonary complications uh, but as the driving pressure has reached 9 the ratio the odds ratio of having pulmonary complications has plateaued out and there is no further increase in the amount of uh, pulmonary complications which has happened so this was a non linear uh, curve where there was a slight increase in the increase of pulmonary complications up to 9 centimeters of water driving pressure but after that it has plateaued out and there is no further increase in the pulmonary complications so uh, driving pressure guided ventilation strategy and uh, did not reduce the rate of pulmonary complications within the first post operative 7 days compared with the conventional ventilation strategy in thoracic surgery patients. This outcome was unchanged even in high-risk subpopulations, including obesity and patients having underlying pulmonary disease as well. So, although we did find a, uh, they did find a intraoperative lung compliance, which was better, and a PAF, PAO2 and a PF ratios, which are substantially higher in the driving pressure group, and the need of rescue ventilation, which was for to treat hypoxemia, was lower in the driving pressure group. But this, these values of compliance and PF ratios and the need for rescue ventilation did not translate into a clinically significant reduction in the incidence of pulmonary complications or extra pulmonary complications or hospital stay or all cause mortality. So, what can be the possible causes for finding no benefit between the two groups? Uh, one of the things which was noticed here, as I've already told, is was, was that there was a relatively small difference in the ultimate driving pressure between which 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 uh, driving pressure between the two groups, and this may have led to having almost equal amount of pulmonary complications in the two groups. So, as I as we have already discussed, there is an improvement in the pulmonary mechanics and gas exchange, but this association is not causation in terms of causing pulmonary complications. Um, we do know that uh, the evidence for driving pressure and mortality in ARDS is pretty strong, where Amato et al. in 2015 and EGM have shown clearly that there is an increase in mortality when the driving pressure keeps increasing. But this may not translate into, this may not be the case for pulmonary complications in thoracic surgical patients per se. Uh, this is one of the uh, lung hysteresis curves where you see uh, on the inflation, you move from uh, from, a, to, from a residual volume to a total lung capacity, but on deflation, you uh, the lung takes another uh, another um, another route where it is which where where with lower uh, amount of pressures you will achieve the almost the same amount of uh, tidal volume. So why this curve is important is is based is basically uh, the. Uh, to titrate the amount of PEEP. If you use a decremental PEEP strategy, you might be able to achieve a good amount of uh, lung recruitment at the lower driving pressures. Lower pressures and lower driving pressures, you might be able to uh, achieve a higher amount of tidal volume. So uh, uh, to discuss further, uh, these are uh, there were several earlier single center trials which have used incremental PEEP strategies. But as I showed you in the previous curve, decremental PEEP titration, uh, which has been used in this trial after alveolar recruitment, uh, this may lead to lower driving pressures because of this lung hysteresis that I explained to you. Uh, earlier, there was an i trial which compared open lung approach with conventional protective ventilation, but that didn't show any benefit. And also in that trial, they have used uh, 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 limiting pressures of around plateau pressures of 40 compared to this trial, which has used a plateau pressures of approximately of plateau pressures of 30 centimeters of water. And in that i proof trial, the PEEP was titrated based on the respiratory system compliance compared to this trial where the PEEP was titrated according to the uh, driving pressures. So what are the strengths of this trial? Uh, it was the largest study and only multicenter uh, trial to assess driving pressure guided ventilation in surgical group of patients. There was uh, a good amount of bias reduction achieved by allocation concealment, modified intention to treat analysis and uh, having no losses to follow up, almost uh, nil losses to follow up. Uh, and they did include patients, as I've already mentioned, that uh, patients with one lung ventilation times more than 60 minutes. And this ensured adequate exposure time to the particular ventilation strategy as well. There were quite a few limitations. Uh, there was no measurement of auto peep. Uh, this may have estimated driving pressures in both the groups, but uh, there was actually no method to measure the auto peep in anesthesia ventilators. Uh, 
uh, airway driving pressure may not actually reflect the transpulmonary driving pressure across the uh, across the wall of the alveoli which is actually more indicative of lung injury but for all practical purposes airway driving pressures are the ones which are used as the actual driving pressures because they can be easily measured that is the p plat minus the e and uh, some of the outcome events which are used as part of the composite outcome of pulmonary complications may not be linked to the ventilation exposure so, uh, such as the prolonged ventilatory support or a air leak which may not actually be linked to the uh, amount of ventilation exposure that the patient has received intraoperatively uh, lung resection surgery was chosen in this trial uh, but uh, if you know there might be a good amount of surgical manipulation of the operative lung Uh, during the surgery and this may also influence the post operative pulmonary complications rather than the uh, rather than only the ventilation strategy which may, which may not influence the uh, post operative pulmonary complications and uh, decremental peep titration below 10 cm of water has been used even in earlier trials like the provilo uh, trial um, but there might be a subset of patients which may have benefited from peep being more than 10 cm of water so while using such uh, strategies of going from 10 to below 10 as a peep titration we might, the authors might have missed out a few patients who might might have benefited from more than 10 cm of water peep to achieve the best driving pressure and uh, the driving pressure group had three recruitment maneuvers whereas the conventional ventilation group had only one recruitment maneuver and uh, this may have led to better mechanics and gas exchange in the driving pressure group uh, rather than the conventional ventilation group because the peach recruitment maneuver uh, the, the patients might have uh, had better amounts of compliance and better amounts of gas exchange so ultimately the pico statement was basically adult patients who were scheduled for elective thoracic surgery the population the control group was basically patients who were in the conventional protective ventilation group the intervention group were basically patients who were in the driving pressure group and the outcome was the fact that there was no reduction in the composite of predefined major post operative pulmonary complications in the first 7 days after thoracic surgery so to conclude uh, driving pressure guided ventilation improved pulmonary mechanics and gas exchange but did not reduce the incidence of pulmonary complications in the first 7 post operative days convened compared to a conventional protective ventilation strategy in thoracic surgery so at this current point of time uh, there is uh, it does not support the routine use of driving pressure guided ventilation in lung res- resection surgical patients for the purpose of reducing post operative pulmonary complications thank you